Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Sports Miles Football Shorts. I'm Barney Corkill. I'm here with our football editor Matt Law and we're here to discuss our Game Week 21 predictions for the Premier League season. Uh, it's a busy weekend of action. We'll get straight into it with Everton versus Newcastle on Saturday lunchtime. How do you see this one going, Matt? Yeah, so pr- probably uh, in terms of you know results this week, pretty comfortable for me. Um, home win, I've gone 2-0 I've gone Everton. I just think, um, obviously Everton, 1-1 uh, draw of Leicester, wasn't it, last time out? I thought... Obviously, Rodriguez's goal was was great, wasn't it? A fantastic mm-hmm. strike. And for me, I mean, I'll get your opinion on it after, but Pickford's, I mean, he's got to save that one, isn't he? The straight out. I mean, it's not the first time we've seen something like that from Jordan Pickford. Obviously, he's still England's, you'd, probably still England's number one at the moment, but he does make a lot of mistakes. And I think if Everton would have beat Leicester, that would have sent out a big sort of um, statement, really, for their ambitions this season. Because it's down in seventh still at the moment. Obviously, Tottenham lost, didn't they? So that's they've not pulled clear of them. And it, I still think Everton will fancy themselves as being in the top four race. I mean, there was talk, wasn't there, at maybe the outside title challenge. I don't think that's anywhere near capable. But I mean, what we look at the moment there, they're four points off Liverpool, two games in hand. And I think it is important at this game stage of the season, the game's in hand. Obviously, uh, Decore, you fancy he'll come back in for Everton in this game. He, he was suspended, wasn't he, for the Leicester game? And he's he's been very good. Newcastle, on the other hand, another defeat, wasn't it? I think, I mean, it's easy to be really negative about Newcastle, and I have been negative recently. But I think the fact they had, I think they had 22 shots against Leeds, so I think five on target. So it's, it's certainly an improvement in terms of their attacking output, obviously finding the back of the net, which they hadn't managed to do for a little while, is obviously another positive. But it's another defeat, and well, they've done in 16th at the moment. Still teetering in and around, obviously six points above the bottom three, but Everton, uh, Fulham, sorry, have a game in hand. So it's certainly an interesting period for Newcastle. They really need to start putting wins on the board, let alone points, don't they? Because it just, it's, it's a struggle. And they play Palace and Southampton after this, then Chelsea and Manchester United. So tough little run. I think that, I think they will get better, Newcastle. I think that can, the performance against Leeds was a lot better, but Everton here 2 0. Yeah, I've gone exactly the same. I agree. I think Newcastle will get better. I think this run has obviously um, put a bit of gloom around the, the club. And obviously, we've mentioned Steve Bruce and the uh, pressure he's coming under increasing every single week. Um, and you can see why now six consecutive defeats in a row across all competitions, 11 games without a win, um, no win since December 12th. Um, it is looking pretty bleak for them. But they do have those players who we keep mentioning quite often who can get the goals and and, and do the things which can get wins in certain games um, and should be enough to keep them clear of relegation job. Obviously, some of those have been missing recently, but coming back now. Um, so, yeah, I do see them, you know, getting out of this really bad slump they're in sooner rather than later. But like you, I can't really see it happening in this game. Everton have been much better than Newcastle have this season, simply put. And Everton are going back towards near full strength now. I think Allen is still out. But other than that, all those players who are so impressive um, in the first half of the season... Um, are, are now back at the, the opening stage of the season when they were on such a really good form. Uh, Richarlison, James Rodriguez, uh, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, Luca Dean, people like that. And when they've got them all fit and firing, they've, they've got a really good team and certainly a team in this season um, that is capable of pushing for those European places. Um, as you say, a draw against Leicester, um, which was would have been a victory but for that Pickford mistake, is a, is a good result. Leicester in really good form at the moment, flying high. So to get a point off them is a good result, even at Goodison Park. Um, and coming into this one, they'll be so confident. Newcastle haven't even scored away from home in their last six attempts um, on, on the road. So, it's, yeah, like you, I can't even back them to score in this game, yet alone uh, maybe get something out of it. So both going for 2-0 wins to Everton in that one fairly comfortably. Uh, Saturday, 3pm, we've got Crystal Palace versus Wolves. Uh, two teams in growing need of a victory, really. Wolves, um, are they down in 13th? Crystal Palace in 14th. Only goal difference separating them in the table. Wolves is now seven league games without a win after that goal of straw with Chelsea, uh, which was a, a little bit of a, a nothing game, really. Chelsea dominated possession, but not too many big chances for either side in what was Thomas Tuchel's first game in charge of Chelsea. Uh, but how do you see this one going? It's, it's two teams not separated by much in the table whatsoever and two teams probably in need of a victory after disappointing results recently. Yeah, I think they are both, I say both sides uh, will obviously be eyeing this one as a win, but I've just gone 1-1 here. I think looking at the recent, let's say the form, they're exactly the same. You say points this season, their record's the same in terms of, you know, wins, draws, defeats. You know, matching each other this season, and I think Palace's game with West Ham was certainly an interesting game. Um, thought West Ham, I expected that to be a draw, but West Ham, in fairness, were were really good. And uh, sort of the way they're playing at the moment, they gave Palace a really good game. Obviously, Palace came into it 
late on and threatened to you know, Nick something late on, but but wasn't to be. And yeah, I think they've got Mateta for this game. Might come in for his debut. Might he, he missed out against West Ham uh, visa issues, but he is he has been cleared to play in this game. Hodgson saying he, he won't know whether he will, will be on the bench or he'll start him. And he's got seven Bundesliga goals this season in fifteen games for Mines. Obviously, he's he's on loan there at, at Palace now. It'll be interesting to see how he does. As a young striker that's got. A lot of ability, and um, I think they're in need of that. Zaha's in need of help, you know. As I think Ben Teke has been better, but Batshuaya, Jordan Ayew hasn't been as good as he was last season, and they are struggling for goals, aren't they? And, and Wolves obviously have brought in William Jose uh, came on didn't he, against Chelsea, and I mean the game against Chelsea. It was again, it was quite a strange game, wasn't it? Chelsea, obviously, we all know about the passing statistics in that game, but Wolves were resolute at the back, and and you know managed Willy Bolly. Coming back into the side, obviously, is huge for Wolves. He's such a good player. Um, but yeah, I think they need to win Wolves, don't they? We all know that. They're down in 13th. Finished seventh, haven't they, in the last two seasons? But I think they're going to be miles off seventh this season. I don't think they're strong enough to finish there. But yeah, I think it was 1-1 um, when they played last season um, at, at, at Selhurst Park. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a 1-1 for me again here. I think it'll be a tight game. Um, yeah, 1-1. Yeah, I've gone exactly the same again. I think, um, as you say, there's just not much to separate them in the table. There's not much to separate them at the moment in terms of form. Uh, Wolves away from home, no wins in the last five, stretching back to November. Um, home and away, they're really struggling to pick up these victories at the moment. As you mentioned, William Jose, you'd hope that he would increase their goal threat because 21 goals scored from 20 games is pretty poor. And obviously, we know the problem they have with Raul Jimenez, but they weren't exactly... Uh, free scoring when they had him in the team as well so something does need to change there especially with the quality of attackers they've got um, we mentioned Adama Traore quite a lot in this in this um, podcast and he's obviously got all the great attributes uh, which make him impossible to defend at times but I think this season his return in terms of assisting goals is is, is awful um, and Pedro Neto needs to be weighing in with more. They've got some good attacking players, but they're just not producing at the moment in the final third. As soon as they do click, they should start to rise the table. But yeah, as you say, finishing seventh in the last two seasons, this season has been such a disappointment for them, especially in such an open season where you, you see the, the sorts of clubs who aren't necessarily usually up there challenging for the top six, likes of West Ham, Everton up there at the moment, Aston Villa certainly in the conversation as well. Wolves, are, Wolves on the last two seasons, on the basis of that, they would have, really fancy their chances of being in and amongst that group and maybe even pushing even higher for challenging for a top four spot but it just hasn't materialised this season really disappointing and at the moment in their form it is difficult to back them to get the win and Crystal Palace um, yeah um, recently they've lost to obviously that game against West Ham and then Man City before that a decent draw um, at Arsenal uh, but yeah I can see them getting a point from this one they, you know Crystal Palace is the sort of team you can you could nick a point in most games in the league and you never really know um, the inconsistencies they've got. You never really know which Palace is going to turn up, whether they're capable of beating one of the big teams as they have done a few times in recent seasons, um, whether they're going to lose heavily or whether they're going to hold um, a team to a draw. And I think I'm going for the latter in this one, as you are both going for one or draws. Uh, Man City, the new table toppers um, against Sheffield United. It's top versus bottom, as we said it was last week. They're going into it with Man United playing Sheffield United, and Sheffield United really upset the odds there. Um, can you see them doing the same here? It's a, it's a big ass. We said it was a big ass, and neither of us gave them a chance at Old Trafford, but then they came and stunned United. Can you see them doing the same against Man City? Uh, no, I can't, to be honest. I think, you know, ahead of the United game, Chris Wilder said, didn't he? It was a, they had a very, very tough double header in Manchester coming up and obviously, you know, got through the first one. Obviously, from a personal point of view, wasn't wasn't good to see that. But from Sheffield United's point of view, you know, they were resolute at the back and, you know, they caught United, I think, on a on a really off day, as poor as I've seen United for for quite a while, perhaps not even this season, probably back in the last season and maybe over the last 12 to 18 months, that's, that's as bad as I've seen United, especially at home. But... Sheffield United, Phil Jagielka at the back, wasn't he? he turned back the, the the clock and put in a fine performance. Obviously, got a slight bit. I mean, uh, for me, the, the first goal was a foul. And then if you're going to give that one, then you've got to allow the Maguire one that, that goes in down the other end. I thought they were a little bit fortunate with that. And obviously, the, the second goal from Burke could have hit Tunzavi and gone absolutely anywhere. But it happens to, you know, going off the crossbar. And listen, they, they, they drew a bit of luck. I think they've they've been in games this season and they've... Um, to had things go against them so to pick up that win obviously it was I had a bad feeling before the game to be honest uh, I just had a sneaky fear just because 
you know how, how you know how football is and when saying is so certain you just have a little thinking that they might be able to pick saying up there and obviously it was a huge win but they're still I mean they're still it's still a huge ask isn't it when you're talking about you know they can they possibly stay up this season obviously eight points mm-hmm. I mean Brighton in 17th or 18th so it's 10 I mean it's a it's, you've seen some great escapes down the years, but this would have to be, you know, something that's truly special, particularly as they go in. Oh, you know, they play West Brom, don't they, in their next home game, which is huge. They play Chelsea after that, and then West Ham. It's a, it's a very interesting run. And if they could pick up a point or something in this game, and then go and beat beat West Brom, you you just never know. I, I would still be surprised, but yeah, City on the other hand, obviously. Strange at the moment, they're really playing for striker, are they, at the moment? You know, mm. Gabriel Jesus was on the bench again against West Brom, put five past West Brom, irresistible in that game. You know, Ilkay Gundogan has been stand out, hasn't he, in recent weeks. Guardiola has obviously been praising him. And I think Foden, obviously, has come into some really good form. Sterling was on the score sheet against West Brom. Cancelo's playing excellently at right back. So, two good centre-backs now. So, it's looking good for City, like you say, top of the league. And obviously, they'll be looking to win this game. If United play Arsenal, don't they, this weekend? A couple other tough games elsewhere. So, Leicester, Leicester leads, which, which is not an easy game. So, if they win this game, City, you fancy they will maybe open up a little bit of an advantage because they're just on an absolute winning run at the moment. And uh, yeah, I can't really see Sheffield United getting anything else on 2-0 to City. Oh, I had gone the same. I might change that to to, to be a bit different. Um, I was weighing up between 2-0 and 3-0 because, yeah, but Sheffield United don't often get beaten by much. And you have to respect their improvement recently. Four wins from the last five across all competitions, which after Mm -hmm. such a poor run before that is an impressive turnaround. Okay, two of those have come in the FA Cup against lower league opposition, but those wins against Newcastle and especially the win against Manchester United, you know, should be huge for them, massive for their confidence. Um, like you, I think they've probably still given themselves too much to do that 10-point gap. Um, but, you know, if they start to get on a roll like they were last season, they've got pretty much the same players, they've got the same manager, they can start to get on a roll and start picking up results. We've mentioned a few times they, they're probably very much a confidence team um, and nothing will give you more confidence really than winning at Old Trafford against the Man United side in such good form. Um, so I, I don't think they'll be going into this game expecting too much. Um, but I, but on the flip side of that, I don't think defeat in this game will knock them back or knock their confidence too much unless it's a big defeat, which Sheffield United don't tend to be on the end of. Um, but then going into the West Brom game, yeah, that's massive. If they can win that West Brom game, uh, presuming West Brom don't pick up a point this week as well, then Sheffield United will go above West Brom in the table. Um, so, yeah, and then psychologically, you're not bottom of the table. Uh, suddenly from going from being on course for the worst ever Premier League points tally, you're starting to think of survival again. So those two victories recently in the Premier League have been huge for Sheffield United and suddenly they're not out of the conversation in terms of survival, which is which is massive for them considering how poorly, poorly they started the season. But yeah, at the other end of the table, it is really looking ominous now. Man City, yeah, they, they do lead the table, but also crucially, they've got games in hand over the four teams directly below, uh, one game in hand, sorry, over the four teams directly below them in the table. When you consider they've won 11 in a row, I think it's 18 across all competitions um, without defeat now. It's, it's getting difficult to see teams stopping them again, which um, wasn't the case last season, wasn't the case at the start of this season. Certainly in their two title winning seasons, it became, you know, if Man City dropped points, that was a huge shock, whoever it was against, because it was really difficult to back against them at any stage. Um, they've, they've been through probably 18 months of that not being the case, but now they're starting to get back to those levels again. Um, and as you say, interestingly, it happened, it's happening without Aguero, without a recognised striker. Kevin De Bruyne wasn't there for... Um, the game against West Brom, but you know Man City was superb in that game, one of the best um, team performances of the season, uh, regardless of the opposition it was against. Um, and yeah, the defensive record is by far the best in the league. 13 goals conceded, by far the best in the league there. Um, they're closing in on the best attacking record in the league. Just right now, they look like the best team in the league. And obviously, there was talk for the United-Liverpool game earlier in the season, and both of us would be hoping there'd be in a title race um, as supporters of the respective clubs. But I think right now, we both recognise Man City are the favourites and the front runners and really the team to beat because their form is incredible at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I, I did go 2-0 orig- originally for this one because Sheffield United don't often lose by a lot. But just I've got, I've got to try and make things up in the prediction competition, haven't I? So I'll go for 3-0. I regretted not going for more against West Brom. I nearly went for 4-0 yeah. in that one. Still wouldn't have got it right. But yeah, but... 5-0 for that one. So, yeah, I've got 3-0 Man City, Sheffield United. Cool. Um, 
All right, we spoke about West Brom there. They've got a um, another big game at the bottom coming up against Fulham, who have just played the team just above them in the table in Brighton and drew 0-0. Uh, now play the team just below them in the table in West Brom. Uh, there's two points separating them in the table, which means a victory for West Brom would put them um, above Fulham in the table. Victory for Fulham would take them to potentially two points from safety. So that would be big for them. Uh, it's a huge, huge game for both sides. West Brom, you know, they're... Their form since Allardyce has come in has not been great. They got that victory um, over West Brom. Uh, they obviously got that draw against Liverpool, which is an impressive result. But um, other than that, you know, not too much to cheer about. And his, the, his record of not being relegated from the Premier League is really looking under threat now. Um, the biggest concern for me would be their home form. I mean, away from home, they've actually picked up some decent results. And it, it will baffle Sam Allardyce that his side is so much poorer at home than they are away from home and I know obviously the, the lack of fans in the stadium has made that more of a general trend in football at the moment but you know the discrepancy between their home performances and their away performance is huge I think it's 22 goals conceded in the last five home games and Allardyce hasn't been in charge for all of them but you know they look at the last three or look at the last four three nil lost to um, Aston Villa five nil to Leeds four nil to Arsenal and five nil to Man City just just nowhere near as solid as you would expect the Sam Allardyce team to be, particularly at the Hawthorns. And whether that's maybe they take more risks, maybe that's they're a bit more open at home, uh, whatever it is, I think Allardyce first and foremost needs to stop the, his team getting uh, battered by such big scorelines because they've got by far the worst goal difference in the division now, which could come into play uh, should they pick up a few wins and close the gap on 17th place. Uh, by far the most goals conceded in the league this season. It's just looking bleak for them. Um, of course, in that time, they have played a few difficult teams, the likes of um, Man City, obviously, last time out, Arsenal. Uh, Leeds can score a lot of goals against most teams. Aston Villa, as well, can score a lot of goals. That's not really the case with Fulham, so they'll come into this match more confident of getting something. And this is one I've, I really did go back and forth on. Um, I, I went close. That West Brom um, home record put me towards a Fulham victory, but in the end, I've just gone for that elusive nil-nil in this one, I predicted a goal of straw. Yeah, I was very close to doing that, but I did change it uh, this morning. Um, just mm. went one. I, I went nil nil, but I thought you would. And plus, I had a few, a few too many draws in this week, so I've I've gone one nil to Fulham in the end. I just think you mentioned West Brom's goal difference. I mean, forty eight goals conceded this season is is horrendous, mm. isn't it? In twenty games, I mean, you think that the one up from that is Palace with thirty six, like you say, easily the worst in the league. And I think that will be the case whether they stay up or not. I think they'll have the worst. Now, Fulham, on the other hand, you know, conceded 27, actually the same as Manchester United. You know, it's not, mm. I know United uh, shipped six at Tottenham and they've had a few bad defeats this season, but not, you know, if you just said that to Fulham, you know, the team sitting sitting really high up the table, you'd have the same defensive record as them. And as we know, Fulham have been, now they've been difficult to beat in, in recent weeks. Picked up a good, I think it's a good point at Brighton last time out, that, to be honest. I think it was a resolute performance, needed their goalkeeper to be to be good again but mm -hmm. tough run before that lost to United and Chelsea didn't they but you know I was just looking through Fulham's record against West Brom it's actually pretty good recently I mean they haven't lost to West Brom since 2010 um, won the reverse game earlier this season at Craven Cottage 2-0 you know, last win uh, away to West Brom 2013. There was four draws in there as well. But, you know, their recent record against West Brom is actually, like I say, actually really good. So, just think all that West Brom's performance against City, as good as City were, I thought they were really poor. And you just look through the West Brom squad, don't you? And, you know, you look at a team that's down there and you think, similar with Norwich, you know, if they go down, a, a, a team's really going to take many of their players. Is, is the quality really there? And obviously, aside from Pereira, I think he's a really good player. Look throughout the squad, and it's just a championship squad for me. I think if they go down, they'll, they'll probably keep the majority of that together and probably make a strong push to come up again next season. You know, the goal Callum Robinson's got two goals this season, one from Grant, none from Robson Canu. You know, they're, they're just struggling at the moment. And yeah, I just think Fulham have got a better base, a better, better defensive base. I think they've got better quality throughout the squad and played quite well in recent weeks without, you know, picking up maybe the points that they deserve. So yeah, I've just got 1 0 Fulham here. Yeah, I think if there is going to be a winner, I'd probably agree that it would be Fulham yeah. in this one, considering you know the, their recent away form hasn't been bad, despite not picking up many victories. And West Brom's home form has been so poor. But yeah, I've gone for a draw. Matt gone for a Fulham winning that one. The headline fixture of the weekend is Arsenal versus Manchester United. 
Um, Arsenal, obviously, in, in really good form at the moment in the Premier League. I think only Man City have picked up more points over the last six games. Man United were in really good form, leading the way until that uh, home defeat against Sheffield United, which we mentioned earlier. How do you see this one going, Matt? Yeah, it's a really big game, uh, bigger than probably it would have been if United would have, you know, picked up something against against Sheffield United. And yeah, like I say, it was. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and you know moan and cry about decisions, but I did think the first goal was a foul. And uh, if that's given, then you've got to give the Maguire one where he go jumps into the goalkeeper and then Martial scores. But no excuses for the performance. United were way way off. Like I say, like I said earlier, I think that's as poor as I've seen them for you know, arguably 12 to 18 months. I thought they were really, really awful in that game. And a few changes from Solskjaer and whether, you know, in hindsight, whether we look back and regret making those changes, obviously it's, it's difficult to say and it is easy to say that now, but some of the performances weren't great, you know, up front. I don't think Martial was good. I don't think Rashford was good. I just, Greenwood, I think it was the pick of the attackers and he, he got bought off. So I, I think Cavani will come back in for this game, which is a, probably a big ask because he's played a lot of football recently. And I think, it's previously been said that Cavani does tell the manager when he probably needs a little bit of a rest. So it's whether he's got the, the you know, the power in the legs to play a tough game against Arsenal this weekend. But you fancy Lindelof will come back in. Obviously, Fred McTominay that he likes in the big game. So there will be changes and I think there needs to be to, to freshen the side, you know, after a bad performance. And they'll be desperate to get back to winning ways. Especially look at United's run coming up. Southampton and Everton at home after this game. And, that's, they're really tough games, especially at home. You know, I'd be more confident if they were away from home and mm. just a very, very tough period. And United could blink and find themselves, you know, down in sixth, seventh if they, you know, were to pick up, you know, maybe a couple of points in the next three games. So it's a really, really big game. Arsenal, on the other hand, obviously, talking point of Bamiyang, not entirely sure whether he'll be back. He's had a few uh, family problems, hasn't he? He might be back in the squad for this game, but. You know, they didn't need him to beat Southampton, did they, in the mm. Premier League? Because he lost the FA Cup game, but, you know, went and won in the Premier League and Saka was terrific again. Lacazette, Pepe on the score sheet. Playing really well at the moment, Arsenal, to be fair. I think they've changed around. They had some struggles early this season. Obviously, they've got a few injury doubts for this game, so it'll be fascinating to see what what players can come through. And same, same for United, really, what team selection. I think it's going to be fascinating for both sides. So, it's a tough game. It really is... Um, I've just gone one-one in the end. I just think United will be determined to get back to winning way. Uh, sorry, get back to you know, not getting beat. And their away forms this season has been great. And Arsenal, I'm still, you know, still yet to convince in the, in the really big games. So I think both managers would probably be happy enough with a point, and that's what I've gone for one-one. Yeah, exactly the same. Unfortunately, I think um, yeah, the United's away form is just too too good to ignore. Really, well over a year now without defeat um, yeah. away from home. I think if they don't lose this one, it's a new club record for 18 away games in the top flight unbeaten, which is incredible when you consider the uh, incarnations of the team they've had in the past and the success they've had in the past for this current crop to be doing something um, no other previous Man United team has done um, is incredible. And, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for those away performances. Um, And yeah, as you say, they're probably more confident coming to this game away from home than they would be at home, obviously. In, in the reverse fixture, Arsenal picked up that win with Aubameyang's penalty, didn't they? Yeah. Um, and Arsenal went into that game and followed that game in really poor Premier League form. But right now, they're in much better form. So, they'll be a lot more confident coming into this game, probably, than they were going into the reverse fixture at Old Trafford. Um, but yeah, like you, I can see a one or draw in this one. I think Arsenal, um, the, the win over Southampton, I think, was a really impressive victory. Southampton are going through a little bit of a slump right now, but we know how how good they can be. Um, and obviously, recently they beat Liverpool, so they can they can beat these top teams in the league. Um, so for Arsenal to go there three days after losing there in the FA Cup and to win three one pretty convincingly um, with their exciting players, you know, looking on on top form again, um, is huge for them. Uh, team selection, as you say, could be important. Thomas Party, Emil Smith Rowe are among the doubts for Arsenal. They limped off against Southampton. Minor injuries, I think that they're meant to be, but obviously they need to be assessed before this game. Um, and those two, obviously, are two key players in the midfield for Arsenal. Um, it'd be interesting to see if Martin Odegaard comes in, if um, Smith Rowe can't play, if he comes in for his debut, and how he can handle the Premier League. Obviously, usually it takes a bit of bedding in period for players to, to get used to the pace and um physicality of the Premier League so interesting to see if that happens um, so yeah I th- I, the outcome of this game could well depend on um, who Arsenal have fit and available I think um, but yeah like you I've, I've gone for a one or draw in this one I can't really separate them um, and I think you know a one or draw 
it's, it's interesting from a United point of view, would they be happy with that? A one or draw against the Emirates is not a, a not bad result, but it's getting to the stage now where drop points are pretty pretty important. Every single drop point with Man City in such good form. Um, in fact, I'll ask you right now, would you be happy with a point at the Emirates? Probably yes, to be honest. Yeah, I think it'd be an okay result. Obviously, I'd love to win, but looking at you know coming off the back of the Sheffield United result, losing two in a row would be really poor. And listen, I don't think United will win the league this season. I think if they were to finish the top four, that'd be great. And I think a point, obviously, I'd love all three, but it'd be you know an okay result. Mm. Yeah, both going for one all in that game. Then uh, rounding off the action on Saturday is Southampton versus Aston Villa. We mentioned Southampton; they're going for a little bit of a slump in the league. Uh, one win in their last seven games, it is. That did come against Liverpool, as I alluded to earlier, but uh, defeats in their last two against Leicester and Southampton. And they're playing an Aston Villa team who have have been good this season, but are also going through a bit of a slump in the yeah. league. One win in the last uh, five league games, um, three defeats in the last four, including that one against Burnley last time out, where they played really well, probably should have been out of sight, but for Nick Pope being in really good form. Um, and then Burnley came back. And, and got that 3-2 victory, which I don't think many people expected, not just for them to get the win, but for them to be five goals in that game. There's not usually many goals at Turf Moor. Um, so for that to be such an entertaining game. But I mentioned last week, Villa just got a lot of good players. Um, and, you know, Grealish again was superb in that game. and d- Didn't really deserve to end up on the losing side. So um, they'll, be, they'll be going into these games, pretty much every game now, confident that they can get something out of it. The, the Burnley defeat was a disappointment. They do need to get back to winning ways soon. That's four defeats in five across all competitions. Of course, one of those was the FA Cup when they had their youth team out. Um, but yeah, looking at them in the table, there's only goal difference separating them. Level on points, Aston Villa do have a game in hand over Southampton. Uh, two teams who have been impressive this season, uh, but going through a bit of a slump at the moment. And this is one I, I did go back and forth on again. I think Southampton, Southampton's slump in terms of their performance is a little bit more marked than Aston Villa's. I think Aston Villa are still playing well um, and they've played some difficult teams. Obviously, the, the defeat against United recently uh, was only a narrow one. The defeat against Man City uh, recently was, again, only a narrow one and controversial. The first goal Man City scored in that one, then they beat Newcastle and then they lose to Burnley when they should have won the game. Um, obviously, you don't get any points for, you know, should have won the game, but they're not they're not performing badly despite these results. So I can see them picking up another win here. I think Southampton's slump will end sooner rather than later, but I don't see it happening here. I've gone for a 2-1 Aston Villa win in this one. 2-1. Yeah, I've gone 1-0 Villa. Uh, so it's yeah, different in that. I just think, you know, mentioned form. I think, you know, Villa 10th in the table at the minute. Southampton 11th level on points, but Villa have got a game in hand and two games in hand over Arsenal. So they'll be hoping that Arsenal, you know, drop points and Villa can move. You know, move up to, you know, Chelsea as well. They'll be eyeing, you know, Chelsea play Burnley, don't they? So they'll be hoping to move a couple of places if they were to win this game and just think the thing with Southampton is their injuries they've had recently, absentees, you know, Bertram was suspended. I think the drop off in quality for Southampton is is really big, you know, when they haven't got, you know, Vestergaard, you know, Oriel Ramu in midfield, two, you know, really key players and their replacements just I think they're quite, you know, Bertram was suspended the last time. I just don't think they're, you know, it's not like they've got two fantastic, you know, top draw options in every position and they're not expected to, you know, as a Southampton that's still building but the drop off in quality, I think, is 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 like worrying for Southampton, and that makes me. I think I know they got. I don't think Vestergaard and Ramu are a million miles away from being ready to return, but I don't think they're going to be playing in this game. And Villa, on the other hand, their injury situation is pretty good. And like you say, the Burnley game was the Grealish sent them two one ahead, didn't they? Twenty minutes to go, and you just fancied that you know either it would finish two one or Villa would go and you know get a third or a fourth, but. Fans to Burnley, you know, two goals in I think two goals in three minutes, wasn't it, to turn mm. the match around? And like you say, Villa's form recently, you know, they they are doing really well. But like you say, a little bit worrying their form. You know, obviously lost at lost at Old Trafford, didn't they? Lost at City, two games that they were slightly unfortunate in, beat Newcastle, and then like you say, lost to Burnley. So yeah, it's a tough one. I, I say this was one I almost went to draw again, but just didn't want to go draws and Southampton's absentees and their recent forms. Maybe gone with Villa, one 0 Villa. 
one nil Villa um, for Matt in that one. Okay, Sunday we've got Chelsea versus Burnley. We mentioned Burnley there. Um, they were in a little bit of trouble after a poor run of form, but then three wins in a row across all competitions and some good ones too. Away to Liverpool, obviously at Anfield, huge one. Three nil win at a Fulham in the FA Cup, and then that three two victory over Aston Villa, which we just mentioned. Huge, huge results has taken them up to fifteenth in the table. Uh, what are they now? Nine points clear of the relegation zone. So you know, sitting pretty comfortably there. Um, and with a game in hand over many of the teams below them in the table. So they'll be pretty comfortable where they are at the moment. Uh, Chelsea, obviously, their first game under Thomas Tuchel ended 0-0 against Wolves. Um, plenty of possession. I think they broke the Premier League record for most possession in a uh, for, in a manager's first game in the Premier League since those records began. Um, and it's the most passes in a game in the Premier League this season, but not many chances. Um, obviously, there was interesting aspects of the team selection there with the likes of Mason Mount being left out as well. What did you make of Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea and do you see them getting a first win under his belt against Burnley here? I do expect him to win this game, yeah. I think it'll be tight. I just, it's a very interesting appointment, isn't it, Tuchel? He's obviously a manager who's got a really good CV. It didn't quite work out in the end at PSG, but I think at PSG, you know, they're only really, you know, you're going to win the domestic trophies. It's, it's the Champions League, isn't it, they want there and came close to, to delivering that, but just he wasn't surprised that he moved on. I don't think he's moved on, you know, because he's necessarily done poorly there. It's you know won won trophies, won domestic trophies, but it's a big job, isn't it? The Chelsea job is, and like you say, the team selection was fascinating. Mason Mount coming out was obviously the thing I think that angered the Chelsea fans more than anything because he's been you know probably their best player this season. It was a very you know Giroud came in, didn't he? Obviously Havertz was playing, mm-hmm. and you know. It, Tuchel knows a lot of these players, doesn't he, in terms of, you know, Pulisic, you know, he was on the bench, obviously, Thiago Silva, he knows, and I think he, he was following Jorginho at his time, PSG, um, so he's a player, obviously, that will, players that haven't probably always been in Chelsea's plans this season, they'll, you know, especially Jorginho, he'll come back in, Havertz, you fancy, he'll get a good crack in terms of good opportunities to play, even though his performances haven't been great, and it's going to be the 3-4-3 three, three formation, maybe, you know, almost a 3 it's going to be interesting to see what that, how that works moving forward. Um, if you completely change the way Chelsea have been playing, and yeah, so I say it's a nice game for Chelsea. But like you say Burnley's recent form has been really good, and I think the fact that Burnley beat Villa last time out particularly important as their next two are Chelsea and Manchester City, which obviously are mm. two very very difficult games. But you know, Burnley will go there. I don't think you know the one at Anfield, haven't they? In their, their their last away Premier League game, they won't go there fearing. I don't think. Wolves had to do too much against Chelsea. I thought the Wolves defended well, but lack of cutting edge in the final third. You know, will Timo Werner get a start in this game? Will Abraham? You fancy Mount will come back in. Pulisic. A lot of options. I think that's the thing with Chelsea. They have got a lot of options, haven't they? It's not that they're short of, you know, strikers. They've got strikers, you know, loads of options through the middle. hudson Adoy, will he play again? It's, it's a very interesting game and it is a tight one. It's one that I would not be really surprised at all if it was a, if it was a tight draw, but I just think Chelsea's quality... The fact that Burnley had a tough game against Villa in terms of, you know, putting a lot into it, especially late on to turn the game around. And Chelsea, uh, Tuchel's had more time, isn't he, on the training ground to work on a few mm-hmm. things. So I just think it'll be a tight game, but Chelsea 2-1. Yeah, I've, I've gone for a narrow Chelsea win. I've got 1-0. Um, I yeah. think I think if Chelsea perform like they did against Wolves, Burnley will be pretty happy. They'll be happy to see Chelsea just pass the ball about in front of them. And Burnley, as we saw, saw at Anfield, are experts in keeping their shape and we'll hope for that chance on the break. So I think unless Chelsea offer more of a cutting edge um, and more incisiveness in the final third, Burnley will be pretty happy with a repeat performance uh, from Tuchel's first game in charge. Uh, That's probably what they'll be hoping for. And as I say, try and hit them on the break as they did with Liverpool at Anfield. Um, I do expect Chelsea to find the breakthrough, I think, with with that extra time on the training ground. Um, They seem to have, you know, bought into his philosophy straight away. Those stats, you know, a a lot has been made of them, obviously, but they, they proved that you know, they're, they've immediately changed their style and the, the new formation is very Antonio Conte-esque, isn't it? And they obviously had success for a while under him with that uh, similar formation. So it'll be interesting to see how that fares. Um, and it might be a little bit different, something Burnley weren't expecting to come up against a couple of weeks ago. So they might have to change um, their arrangements for that, how they deal with Chelsea, which obviously for a team as organised as Burnley um, can upset the apple cart a little bit and, you know, make them less... Um, less organised and less expert in the, in their shape and stopping Chelsea doing what they do. Um, but I do see it being a tight game. You can't ignore that Burnley form recently, those three wins in a row. Um, and yeah, and they are the type of team who can, as they proved at Anfield, bloody the nose of any team in the league really and just, you know, 
cause an upset by being stubborn at the back and then hitting them on the break. Um, so as as you say, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a draw. Probably wouldn't be too surprised to see Burnley even go and nick this one. But I am expecting um, a Chelsea victory here. I've gone for 1-0 in this one. Also on Sunday, we've got Leicester versus Leeds. Uh, Leicester still flying high at the, uh, towards the top of the table, third place in the table, but did drop points against Everton last time out, which we alluded to earlier. Leeds returned to winning ways uh, with their first victory of the calendar year at Newcastle last time out. How do you see this one going? Yeah, it's an interesting one, this one. Isn't it? It's one of those that, you know, not it didn't take me ages to, to come to what I've come to, but I just think it's one of those games that could easily be, you know, a banana skin for a Leicester side that are, you know, I mean, what I don't think they're title challengers personally. Obviously, they're, the, the table says they are, but I think I think they're more than in that top four, and I think they're you know they'll get more than happy with that at the moment. Two points off the top of the league. Obviously, City have got a game in hand, and just think this is a this is a particular potentially dangerous game. You know, they've got a couple of injury doubts. I think Evans and and Didi both came off in the game against Everton. Um, obviously, Soyuncu's back now, so I don't think as good as Evans has been. They've got a ready-made replacement to come into the side. Obviously, Vardy, Vardy's out, but Perez played through in the middle, didn't he, against Everton? And I thought he was pretty good in that game. You know, it was a good point for Leicester considering the circumstances. You know, not at full strength against an Everton side that had, as you said earlier, had a lot of their have have a lot of their big players back and pick up a point at Goodison Park is. Is is a good result, you know, at any stage under any circumstances. So it's a, it's a really, you know, I mean, Leicester at the moment they're they're just they're such a difficult team to beat, aren't they? They're mm. so good against Chelsea. They're very very tough to. They can hurt you so many different ways. You know, they went and won a, even the win at Brentford where he made changes. You know, in the FA Cup, Brentford are a you know excellent Championship side, a very very dangerous side, and the way they went there and just won. It's just ones like that, you know, 4 0 at Stoke in the last round of the FA Cup, the one Southampton, Chelsea 2 0 in the league. They're just very professional and strong. And there's no like real, sort of, you know, if you want me about panic performances in terms of, oh, you know, we have to, it just seems all very sort of calm and considered at the moment from Leicester. And I'm expecting a similar one here. I say their last two of the last three in the Premier League have been 2 0. And I've gone 2 0 here. You know, Leeds, Leeds will be, you know, in the table, 12th in the table. You could have offered that to, you know, the manager, the fans, they'd have taken that all day long. You know, they're not in any relegation trouble at the moment in terms of, you know, I'd be very surprised if they were. Obviously, an excellent win at Newcastle last time out, which followed three straight defeats in all competitions. So, it's a really good win to pick up that. And I think it takes the pressure off a touch coming into this game. It is always difficult if they'd have gone in off the back of another defeat. You know, Rafinha's been great this season. Harrison came up with her the winner at Newcastle and I just think you know the fact that Lorente came off injured in that game again is certainly worrying because he's such a good player and I've seen a bit of him in Spain and it looks like he's facing another little period out which is not great but you know got a, got a lot of good players you know there are no major absentees apart from that for this game so yeah I think I think Leicester I think retire I think Leicester Leeds will cause them problems but just Leicester 2-0 here yeah, I've gone Leicester two one. I I always really back Leeds to get get on the score sheet yeah. and get a goal. Obviously, the the goals against Newcastle were their first of the calendar year, but uh, over the course of the season, they've proven themselves really dangerous. And as you say, they've got their players like Rafinha, House, and Bamford. Obviously, been really good in front of goal this season. Um, they've got the players to score against any team in the division. I can see them doing so against Leicester. But yeah, it, it is difficult to back against Leicester at the moment. They're in really good form. They look like an accomplished outfit. It, they don't have the feeling, even in their title winning season when they were, you know, picking up great results time and time again um, and thoroughly deserved that title. There was almost a sense that, you know, this was a very much a one off. They didn't really belong there. Whereas this season, they they do belong amongst these teams. They're, they're playing really well, every bit as good as those teams there in and around in the table. Um, the one thing you would say about them is they've lost more more games than anyone else in the top four. Um, so that maybe raises a red red flag a little bit to see, you know, they're capable of those those matches where they maybe take their foot off the pedal a bit and suffer with a defeat. Uh, that's happened more often at home than it has away from home this season. So this is certainly a banana skin for them. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's picking holes in what has been a really good season for them so far. Um, Leeds have been inconsistent, as we said many times. It's difficult to know which Leeds will turn up. They're more than capable of going to the King Power and coming away with a victory. Um, but their their form so far this season, nine defeats in 19 games. You know, as you say, newly promoted. They'll be pretty happy with 12, pretty content with 12, rather. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't see them getting the victory here. I've gone for 2-1 to Leicester in this one. 
Um, also on Sunday, we've got West Ham versus Manchester, uh, West Ham versus Liverpool, sorry. Um, and Liverpool, I made the fatal error of backing against them last week, Matt, and I will never make that mistake again. They go and beat Tottenham 3 1. Um, really good performance from Liverpool, really poor performance from Tottenham. Um, obviously, a lot of defensive errors in there from Tottenham, but a, a huge result in terms of um, their season for Liverpool, I think. I, I did expect their slump to end, but as I said, I didn't expect it to end in that game. I thought that would be a really difficult game for them, um, the way Tottenham would sit back. Um, but that goal just before half time from Firmino was a, a big moment to open up the game, I think. Um, absolutely huge moment. And obviously, those were their first Premier League goals of the year, their first Premier League win of the year, first Premier League win since before Christmas. So, Absolutely huge. When, when you consider Man City had moved seven points um, ahead of them, having played the same amount of games, you know, that if, if, if they've still got their sights set on the title, that was bordering on must win in the terms of uh, in the form Man City are in at the moment. Certainly put the pressure on. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, I think it's getting to the stage with that Man City form where any drop points are could be really important come the end of the season now. So Liverpool will go into this game hoping that they've very much got their mojo back and hopefully hoping that they're very much back on form in terms of goal scoring. They they, seem, they created chances against Tottenham, which was good to see after a, a few games without really creating much. Could have had more than the three goals they got. Um, but they are coming up against a West Ham team in really good form. Six wins in a row across all competitions. I think it's eight wins in 13 since they last played um, Liverpool in the reverse fixture. They're in really good form and they had displaced Liverpool in the top four um, until Liverpool won against Tottenham. So there's only two points separating them in the table. Um, fifth place, West Ham versus fourth place, Liverpool. Uh, so when, when we say Liverpool are still amongst the title challenge, as, as you'd expect, West Ham, you know, two points off them. They're very much in that top four battle themselves, which they wouldn't have expected. David Moyes does deserve huge credit um, for, for the job he's done. And the form they're in at the moment is really, really impressive. Um, they've, I mentioned Aston Villa earlier. They've got a lot of players who are just really good attacking players who could make a difference in games. I think West Ham fall into a similar category now. They've got a lot of players who can make a difference and could cause problems for Liverpool's defence. Um, having said that, I do expect Liverpool to, to win this one, I think. David Moyes' record against Liverpool, I think, of right in saying, is, is pretty poor. Um, and Liverpool, they just seem back to their old selves at Tottenham after a, a little bit of a slump, which obviously there was a lot made of that slump, but they seem back to themselves against Tottenham. So, yeah, I'm, I'm backing them to win this one 2-1. 2-1, yeah, almost almost went the same. Very, very close to going 2-1 okay. Liverpool. I just, I've just gone 1-1 in the end. I just Obviously, Liverpool, Matty injured again, wasn't he? The, mm. the centre-back injuries for, for, obviously, as you all know, Never more than anyone... Is I mean Fabinho is he is he looks like he might be back. This yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a minor muscle problem. So yeah, it, yeah, they haven't heard so you fa- anything you, more than that. You, yeah, you fancy he will be back, but I mean still, still you know major major problems at the back, mm. and the fact that Matty does can't seem to stay fit. You know, with obviously you know Gomez and Van Dijk being out and. You know, West Ham, I mean, I'm sure by the time, you know, people watch this afternoon, I think the Lingard's confirmation has come through. Yeah, but obviously West Ham are signing Lingard. They've made Ben Rahman's deal permanent this morning, which obviously is the even stronger indication that Lingard will be arriving on loan for West Ham. I think it's a really good signing for West Ham. You know, like I said in the last one, you know, player that David Moyes knows well. And, you know, if they can get in a striker in, obviously it's going to be a rush in the latter stages of the window. If West Ham were to get a striker in as well, I think they'd uh, say make a real strong push staying around sort of the top. I don't think the top four is in, in their grasp, but top six, top seven and the top seven for West Ham would be incredible considering the you know open nature of the league and the amount of teams that are you know in that sort of race uh, joining the top teams at the moment. So yes, it's a really interesting game. I thought obviously Liverpool were helped, not helped in the sense that, you know, the, the, the Tottenham goal, the Sun one that got disallowed, obviously it's the right decision, but it was very, very close, wasn't it? And Kane going off injured. I think it was a lot that went in Liverpool's favour in that game. Obviously, Liverpool had one chalked off themselves, didn't they, for the handball, which I thought was also, you know, the, the right decision. Um, I mean, there's so many different rules at the moment, isn't there? The handballs, they're trying to um, sort of take away the ones that were given this season, but but that was, you know, right because it didn't lead to an immediate goal scoring opportunity or something like that. But it, it, the rules at the moment, that was the right decision. But obviously, Liverpool managed to edge out a win. And, you know, Tottenham were disappointing, some defensive mistakes. But as you say, a, a huge win for Liverpool under the circumstances. And it's not that long until they play City. So they need mm. to stay in and around, don't they, in and around City? Because if they were to be, you know, five, six points behind City, then lose against City, suddenly, you know, you could be 
looking you know a very difficult situation so yeah I was very very close to going 2-1 Liverpool here but I just think the uncertainty surrounding the defence and the fact that does take away from their midfield and going forward and West Ham's form which must be taken into consideration they've been excellent Antonio can cause real problems and they've been solid at the back West Ham so playing some really good stuff so yeah 1-1 here yeah, the defence is certainly a concern for Liverpool and it still doesn't look like they're going to go into the transfer market and get someone mm. new. Um, personally, I'd like to see Nat Phillips get more chances from the start. I think he was really good when he came on against Tottenham and has been good every time he's played in the yeah. Premier League. Um, I think he's more uh, suitable for this level than Rhys Williams um, at the moment. And, you know, when you consider we're down to those levels of uh, centre-back at the moment, I'd like to see Nat Phillips get a few more opportunities. So maybe he will after those performances. Um, against yeah. Tottenham last time out. Rounding off the game, we, we have got Tottenham. They're playing uh, Brighton and Hove Albion, obviously looking to bounce back from that defeat against Liverpool. Brighton got that draw against Fulham last time out, but it's now 14 Premier League games without a win for the Seagulls. They're still five points from safety. They're picking up pretty regular points um, in that time, which is keeping them at arm's length of the relegation zone. But that winless run is extending. It will be a bit of a concern now, um, especially going into what is a difficult game against Tottenham. Tottenham have got Chelsea after this, which is a huge game for them. So they certainly won't want to drop more points um, in a game they'd go into expecting to win like this one. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned it there. The big thing is Kane's going to be missing for this one. Um, yet to get actual confirmation on the extent of his injury. But Mourinho expects him to be out for a few weeks with injuries to both ankles. And we know his ankles have caused him serious problems in the past as well. So that's that's a huge blow to Tottenham. Kane had been in such good form. He'd been you know, one of the best players in the league this season in terms of leading the assist charts right there up near the top of the uh, top scorers charts. Um, he's had a huge say in their season. And without his goals um, and his assists this season, Tottenham would be nowhere near sixth place where they currently are. Um, yeah, we've mentioned a few teams being in that top four battle at the moment. Tottenham certainly in that. I wouldn't say they're in the title race, uh, given Man City's form and the gap between those two teams at the moment. They're certainly in the top four battle. So any drop points here um, could prove really important with that. When you consider, you know, Tottenham were earlier being, earlier in the season being talked about as title contenders. They're now only three points clear of Arsenal. When, when you consider mm -hmm. Arsenal's form throughout the season is incredible. So, you know, if results go against them uh, this weekend, they could actually drop level on points with Arsenal. Um, so the importance of getting a result in this game against a team down there towards the bottom of the table against the team which has really struggled to pick up victories so far this season is huge for Tottenham to bounce straight back. Um, I am backing them to do that, that. I don't think it will be an easy game. We've mentioned a few times Brighton play nice football um, but it's just uh, getting those wins on the board which is proving problematic for them. I think Tottenham um, the, the performance against Liverpool, I think, was poor. This, the second half performance in particular, if I was a Tottenham fan watching that, I would have been furious with that because even, you know, at 3-1 down, there was no one really chasing. They seemed to give up the game with 20 minutes to go and there's still plenty yeah. of time to go. Even maybe you can go back to um, Harry Kane going off. They just look so... You can't... There can't be that much of a drop-off even if your, your main man goes off. It was just really poor in the second half and then Liverpool just controlled the game, passed the ball about, obviously, Tottenham got the goal back and had a little bit of a resurgence after that, uh, shortly after Liverpool went 2-0 up. But the second half performance would have been so disappointing for them and for Jose Mourinho. Um, so he'll be demanding a response from his side in this game. I can see them getting it, but a narrow one. I've gone for 1-0 Tottenham winning this one. 1-0, yeah. I've, got, I've gone 1-1 here. I think Brighton will get a point out of this game. Um, mm. Yeah, similarly, I won't go over what you say, said about the Tottenham-Liverpool game. But what we'll say is... the. Formation was interesting, wasn't it, for Mourinho? Uh, three centre backs. He, he's already said after the Liverpool game, you know, Roden will, mm. Joe Roden will play again in this game. You know, he had a, obviously took a bit of criticism for his, you know, role in, in Liverpool's third, I think it was, wasn't it? So he'll obviously play in this game, you know, but will, you know, Sanchez and Arduero were both on the bench, weren't they? For the, you know, would they come back into contention with, you know, potentially Davis going to a, you know, wing back position? Um, Obviously, Regulon being out is, is again a big miss for them. I think I think because he's been terrific this season, and uh, Lo Celso as well takes away an option that, that would potentially. I think the fascinating thing is who's going to who's going to replace Kane in the eleven. Obviously, Lamella replaced him against Liverpool, but obviously Bale, Lucas, you know, mm. Lucas didn't even get off the bench. It was Bale, wasn't it? it was given the nod to come on late on. So it'd be interesting to see what he does. You know, would he? I wouldn't be surprised to see you know Son through the middle and perhaps you know Lucas come in with, you know, Bergwijn. Obviously, Bale, like I say, is, is an option as well. But I just think Brighton... The thing I'll say about Brighton is, you know, I said about West Brom earlier. Look at West Brom's squad and you think if they were to go down, who would take their players, you know? 
Pereira. But if Brighton were to go down, I think, you know, you're looking at, you know, White, Dunk, mm. Misuma, obviously he's been linked with players, Trossard, Mapay. I think it all get taken from Brighton if they were to go down. They've got some really good players. Like I say, they do play good football. Obviously, winning games has been a problem. But the goal is draw against Fulham. It's not, I don't think it's the end of the world. They'd obviously, it would be a game they would have earmarked a side below them in the table to beat. But I just don't think they didn't lose. They are are quite, you know, they're capable of edging out results. You know, we've seen this season, some of the big teams have gone there and and struggled. And I just think if Kane was available for this game, I I would be going Tottenham, same as you, probably 2-1 to win this game. But Fatty's not there. The performance against Liverpool wasn't good. Team selection and it's a bit muddled at the moment in terms of players and and Brighton, uh, you know, are, are so can can be difficult to beat. So I've gone one one here. Yeah, nine draws already this season for Brighton, as most in the league. And Matt's going for tenth. Then, all right, thank you, Matt. Uh, we'll have previews for all of these games over on sportsmore.co.uk, which you can check out, as well as many other previews for Championship games, games across Europe. You can subscribe to this podcast on all the usual channels. You can subscribe subscribe to us on YouTube as well to make sure you don't miss an episode. Uh, Matt and I will be back on Monday because the Premier League games keep on coming thick and fast. We'll be back on Monday for our next round of predictions. So until then, thanks for watching. <laughs>